So we're looking at a number of places in the Old Testament that verify Jesus provided a model for prayer to his disciples and all believers. They must pray to our Father, which art in heaven, and then acknowledge the Father's holy name, his absolute sovereignty, especially relative to his bringing his kingdom rule into in heaven to the earth, his provision of food, his temporal forgiveness of transgressions being dependent upon one's forgiveness of others' transgressions towards one, his not bringing one into temptation and to falling into sin, but delivering one from evil, And there's a model prayer. So we're looking at the places where we're instructed about that. And we left off at Exodus 4.22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Listen, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Isaiah 64.8 But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are hotter. And all... We are the work of your hands. This is the information that you get out of the Lord's disciples' prayer, we call it, not the Lord's prayer, the disciples' prayer. And it affirms that from Old Testament passages. Jeremiah 31, 9, They shall come with weeping and with supplications I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. <clears throat> Hosea 11.1, 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Furthermore, God is declared to be everlasting father, who will as a God-man rule over Israel and the world. Isaiah 9, 6-7, so the content of the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer, is, is embedded in these Old Testament verses. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from there on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. <clears throat> Your kingdom come. See, these things are said not in a vacuum. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, they will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here are the passages that support this. And the Lord was Israel's father and redeemer. Isaiah 63, 16. Doubtless you are our father, though Abraham was ignorant of us, and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer from everlasting is your name. <clears throat> and then up to Matthew 5, 9. And we call this the New Testament. And actually, it's just the, the final 37 books of God's Word after the 39 Hebrew ones. We call that the Old Testament. The Old Testament is actually the law. The New Testament is God's soon-to-be-fulfilled covenant with Israel, a new generation. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Jesus' frequent reference to God as his Father and as the Father of his disciples, and by implication to all believers, portrayed a personal intimacy with God. Many took this to be presumptuous, even blasphemous. There it is. In Jesus' model prayer for disciples, believers, God's presence in heaven was to be acknowledged, our Father which art in heaven. The next point made in the model prayer instructed the believer to the, the declare reverence, respect for God's name. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, set apart, sanctified, holy be your name. The Greek phrase, there is this Greek phrase, literally, sanctified or set apart by your name and rendered hallowed be your name, in the King James Version, <clears throat> referred to the character of God. The one praying was instructed to declare God's name to be set apart above all names, to honor his supremely unique and infinitely good character. The model prayer goes on to instruct the believer to acknowledge the Father's absolute sovereignty, transcendence, and omnipotence for in fulfilling his purposes on earth as well as in heaven. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done as it is in heaven, on earth, in, a, in earth as it is in heaven. That's, we just corroborated this. <clears throat> Isaiah 9, 6-7. 
This included bringing in his kingdom, bringing his kingdom of rule to the earth. Although the purpose, purpose says of God will be inevitably be accomplished, it honors God to pray, let it be done. It's not that you're praying and I hope it's going to be done. It's praying with the understanding that it will be done. Hopefully, with you being faithful enough to receive rewards in heaven and be co-ruling with him. Thereafter, the model prayer instructed the believer to acknowledge God's provision of food, using the Greek word artan rendered bread, to signify food in general. Matthew 16, 11, Greek, the bread hour of the needed, let it be given us today. Since it is stipulated in Scripture that God makes provision for food for mankind, Psalm 136, 25, then the Greek verb dos, which is in the aorist tense, signified a complete, completed action, and the imperative mood, which is a command, is in this case is in this case is not a command to God for food, for who can command the Lord to do what He declared He would do? Hence, dos is best rendered, "Let us be given." Okay, okay, portraying the believer's acknowledgment that, however, one's food is obtained, it is nevertheless God who has enabled that provision. Somebody says, well, I go and buy my own groceries because I have a job. Yeah. You don't think God's part of that? So, since it is stipulated in Scripture that God makes provision for foods for mankind, Psalm 136, 25, then the Greek verb dos, which is in the aorist tense signifying a completed action, and the imperative mood is in this case not a command for, to God for food, for who can command the Lord to do what he declared that he would do? Hence, das is best rendered, let us be given, portraying the believer's acknowledgement that however one's food is obtained, it is nevertheless God himself who has enabled that provision. The model prayer, disciples prayer, next addressed the issue of temporal forgiveness of transgressions against God. Since believers are in view, who by definition have already been forgiven unto eternal life, and since forgiving others for transgressions committed against one is not stipulated in order to be forgiven unto eternal life, but only through a moment of faith alone in Christ alone would you get eternal life, then temporal forgiveness, not forgiveness unto eternal life, is in view. So, only through a moment of faith alone in Christ alone can one attain eternal life. So, then, temporal forgiveness is in view. A lot of people don't understand. <clears throat> well, I'm a believer. I won't do anything. I need forgiveness. Yes, you will. And the temporal forgiveness doesn't mean you lost your salvation. This means you've lost the opportunity for eternal rewards, but you can get that rescinded by confessing that known sin, and he forgives that known sin that you confessed. And what does he do additionally? Purify you from all unrighteousness, so, so far as he's concerned, because of that confession, you're blameless until you sin again. Then you confess it again. Then you're blameless until you sin again. See, temporal life is letting God direct your life, acknowledging the fact on your conscience, God, Holy Spirit puts it on your mind, that you've done something, a number of things wrong, confess that, and move on. Now he's directing you, you're not directing you. Who's the one that needs to direct you? It's God, not you, don't direct you. Let the Holy Spirit deal with you. You study to show yourself approved. The more you study, the more you realize the standard of God's righteousness. The more you confess, the more God directs your life, and the more you get blessed with eternal rewards. Can you beat that? Stop directing your own life. And let the Word of God through the Holy Spirit and your own personal efforts to study it, do it through God's way. Temple forgiveness implies a restored fellowship of God with the child of God, the believer. It is characterized by the reception of God's temporal mercy and restoration of blessing to replace temporal discipline. You're under his discipline. Now the Greek phrase rendered, and let us be forgiven of our transgressions, as we also forgive our transgressors, is not a command to God to provide temporal forgiveness, nor a request for forgiveness as some contend, but an acknowledgement by believers that temporal forgiveness of the disciple believer would not be forthcoming if he were to be unforgiving of others' transgressions against him. That should be the first thing on your mind. You hold a grudge against somebody. God's going to put that on your mind. You're holding the grudge. Confess that. 
For one cannot be right with God if one has a wrong attitude toward others. Note that verses 14 and 15 explain verse 12, Matthew 6, 12. And let us be forgiven of our transgressions as we also forgive our transgressors, 6, 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, 6, 15. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, <clears throat> neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So, you confess that you haven't forgiven them. In a sense, you're also forgiving them what they've done to you. In verse 13, Jesus' model prayer addressed the issue of temptation and deliverance from evil. And bring us not into temptation, but let us be delivered from evil. The phrase rendered, and bring us not into temptation, should not be interpreted as a request to God to not tempt one to sin. For God, being absolutely righteous, tempts no one to sin. Hence, to ask God to do something that violates his character is not in view. So what is in view? Nor does this phrase mean, do not test us, for God does test the believer's faithfulness. Instead, the phrase means to not allow one to be led into such temptation that falls that one falls into sin. Although God does not initiate it, he nevertheless permits the devil, the world, and one's own sin nature to tempt one to sin. So the prayer's petition is made in the sense of intervening in the believer's life to limit that temptation so that he does not fall into sin. This is corroborated by the next stipulation of Jesus' model prayer, which is begun with the conjunction rendered but signifying the opposite of being led into temptation unto sin, and bring us not into temptation, but let us be delivered from evil. So, to be delivered from evil is the, is the opposite of being led into temptation unto sin. Point 14. Compare Matthew 6, 13b. But deliver us from the evil. In the phrase, Allah will see him as apotu panaru, rendered but let us be delivered from evil, in Matthew 16, 6.13b, the Greek word paneru, rendered evil, which is accompanied by the definite article, does not refer to the devil as some contend. It means evil, denoting the evil present in the world, throughout the world, as perpetuated by man, as a result of his own sin nature, as well as the devil, which encompasses more than the evil per perpetrated by the devil alone. Matthew 6.13, Paul up to this point can be found in a number of these manuscripts. They seem pretty significant. And on the other hand, there is a manuscript evidence for the phrase rendered, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the New King James Version at the end of Matthew 6, 13. The additional words at the end of verse 13 appear in these manuscripts. They do not appear in all of the most ancient texts of the old Latin version of the Vulgate and so on. So it is found in a majority of manuscripts, though not the oldest. It is also found in all the Syriac versions, even the Peshito, the Aramaic, dating probably as early as the second century, although this version lacks the Amen, which the doxology, if genuine, was sure to include. If it, is, it is found in the Sahidic or the Thebaic version made for the Christians of Upper Egypt, possibly as early as the old Latin and it is found in perhaps most of the later versions. So I'm just giving you some manuscript evidence here. The additional words inter, inter, interrupt the context of the verses connected with the following two verses, Matthew 6, 14 and 15, which serve to explain verse 13. Hence, it must be ruled as a later addition and ruled out as part of the original text. Hence, Jesus' model prayer ends here without the phrase, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And verses 14 and 15 explain verse 12. So we have an excerpt from Matthew 6, 12 relative to the forgive issue of forgiveness of transgressions against God in the sense of temporal forgiveness since believers are in view or by definition have already been forgiven unto eternal life and since one need not to have to forgive others for transgressions committed against one in order to be forgiven unto eternal life but only through a moment of faith alone in Christ alone, then forgiveness unto eternal life is not in view, it's temporal forgiveness. Temporal forgiveness implies a restored fellowship of God with the child of God, the believer, characterized as the reception of his temporal mercy and restoration, a blessing to replace the temporal discipline.